Good morning, Trinity Church. Let's stand together as we proclaim the life in Christ that we have because of what Jesus did on the cross. He's erased our sins, and we will never be the same. Let's sing this out together. I once was dead in sin, alone and hopeless. A child of wrath, I walked condemned in darkness. But your mercy brought new life, and in your love and kindness, raised me up with Christ and made me righteous. You have brought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love I made. I'll never be the same. My sin has been erased. I'll never be the same. All right, sing this out. You have Oh, God. 
Well, guys, we're super glad you're joining us this morning. Why don't you turn around and greet someone nearby? Well, good morning, Trinity Church. How are you guys doing this morning? Not bad. You had more coffee than the 8 a.m. did, so good job. Good job. You're properly caffeinated. Well, hey, my name is Luke, and I am the middle school director here at Trinity. It is my privilege uh, to walk you through a, a bit of your Trinity this week. If you received one this morning, uh, pull that out for me. You can use that as a fan when you get outside. Summer is here, and I'm sad. Uh, for those of you that enjoy the cool weather, you are, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> Those of you who like it hot, you're crazy. Uh, but uh, we got some hot news for you this morning. That's a little segue. So let's check it out. If you open up your Trinity this week, there is a little insert card. Love for you to take a look at that uh, about our kids' ministry. Now, I don't know if you are 
too familiar with our kids' ministry, we have some incredible, hardworking teachers who serve within that ministry all school year long. And we like to give them a chance to get refreshed over the summer, to take a break, so that they want to come back next year and work all school year long. And so uh, if you have in any way a heart for kids, maybe uh, you have thought about serving in kids' ministry, you're not sure if it's the right fit, and you've been nervous about making that kind of a commitment. Maybe you can't do that year-long thing, but this summer you would say, I could maybe do that for a summer. Well, if that's you, uh, you could serve as part of our summer relief team that comes in and allows those teachers who work hard all year long to get a break. And if you're interested in that, fill out that card. There's all sorts of positions that you can serve in, whether you're a student, whether you are an adult, whether you want to be a special needs buddy. There are a lot of different roles you can serve in. So fill that out, drop that in the offering plate as it goes by, or drop it off uh, in the kids' check-in area, and they will get in touch with you and see if you would be a good fit for working with them this summer. Now, uh, for we have another event coming up, and dads, I don't know if you realize, next weekend is Mother's Day. And so if you have not figured out what to do for that yet, let me suggest to you the best gift you can give is for you and the kids to leave. And you can do that. Put your registration for the dad kid camp out inside a card. Give it to your wife and say, honey, we love you. So we're leaving. And you will have a great time. Bonus, we never get enough time as dads with our kids. This is a great way to get time with the kids where someone does all the hard work of planning the fun activities, planning the meals, planning everything for you, doing everything but setting up your tent. Sorry that's on you. You got to find that. But... Uh, get all that stuff done, handle, you have a great time, get some great uh, moments with the kids, and, and we would love for you to join us. That's May 18th through the 20th in Rancho Harupa Park in Riverside. More information is available on trinityonline.org, so check that out, get registered, your wife will love you for it. So uh, do that. Now before we move on, uh, would love, here at Trinity we like to every week highlight one of our missionaries or one of the ministries we partners, partner with, and today is no exception. If you remember a few months back, uh, we commissioned Jordan and Jenny Mason. They're serving with a crew in the, the San, uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo area with both that campus and others surrounding it. And since we commissioned them a few months ago, they have had a new baby boy. His name is Caleb Daniel. And so we're really excited about that. And we want to pray for them as they're entering into a new season of ministry with a new baby and trying Trying to remember what sleep is like. And so if you would join me this morning, we want to lift up uh, Jenny and Jordan, pray for their ministry with crew, pray that God would bless them uh, and bless them as they unite together as a new family in a new setting. And so join with me as we pray. God, I thank you uh, that uh, you love uh, Jordan and Jenny and Caleb, and you have a purpose for their lives to serve you with crew. Uh, we pray that, uh, God, you would give them amazing divine appointments uh, where they are meeting with college students, interacting with faculty, discipling uh, these, these students that need uh, that encouragement, need that love that the gospel can provide in their lives. Help them to uh, adapt in a place where they may not have uh, family family nearby as they're adjusting to new life with a baby. Uh, give them a supernatural strength as, as they are walking through this new season. And, and may they feel your peace, your contentment, uh, care for any of their support needs they might have. Father, uh, God, we entrust them to you and, and look forward to hearing reports back about how you are working through their lives. So we thank you for the new uh, blessing of, uh, of Caleb. Thank you for that ministry and thank you uh, for that team uh, that is a part of our family out serving. Uh, all God's people said, amen. Amen. Good morning. How are you doing today? It's great to see you. And uh, we have this great opportunity on a regular basis to just pause and to pause and to consider what it is that God has done for us and how he has created a way for us to be right with him. We believe at Trinity Church that we are all, every one of us on the planet, are lost apart from what God has done to reach down to us in the person of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And so this communion table is an opportunity on a regular basis to stop and say, God, I just want to be refocused, recalibrated in my gratitude and my thanks for what you've done for me. 
Today, as we even finish this narrative on the life of Joseph, a, a huge theme within what we're looking at is the idea of forgiveness. And I don't know, I don't know if you've thought about it recently, but whenever we forgive, and, and hopefully that's going on a lot, there's a lot of issues in our interpersonal relationships that forgiveness should probably be happening on a daily basis. But when you forgive, in essence, it's an unfair thing. I don't know if you've thought about that before. Someone has wronged you, and where you would be compelled to want to wrong them back, forgiveness says, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And said, that debt that I have, that you have towards me, I'm going to erase that. I'm going to put a zero at the bottom of that tally. And so it's an unfair thing. And the reality is, is that forgiveness makes sense when we understand what God has done for us, that he has forgiven us. That's why the Bible says, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. So this aspect of forgiveness, it, it was not something cheap. It was not something that God could just do. He had set in place for himself that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So it's Jesus' blood shed for us, his body broken for us that we celebrate today. And it gives us the ability not only to be forgiven, but to forgive. So as we come to this table today, I'd encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, this table is for you. You're welcome to it. If you're here today and you haven't yet made that decision, you haven't yet responded to this invitation of forgiveness, and God's amazing love, I would just ask you, what are you waiting for? What next step, what thing are you waiting to somehow connect a dot for you? And I would say, even in this moment, even in this moment, A, admit that you're a sinner who needs a savior. B, believe Jesus is the only savior available. C, choose. Even in this quiet moment, and the moments ensuing today respond to the gospel, respond to this great invitation of forgiveness. We're excited that we get to do this today. Let me pray for us. Father, we count it an incredible privilege to come before you today with a sense of recognition, a sense of understanding that you have made a way for us. God, all the religion in the world would never put us in a position that we could be right with you. And what you ask us for is not that we would somehow sacrifice for you. You have sacrificed for us. So we thank you that Jesus was a, not only the available to be the spotless lamb of God in his sinless life, but God, that he was willing. And he let himself be put on a cross in our place. So for those things today, we have gratitude. We say thank you for what you've done for us. And we pray in his great name, amen. The elements are going to be passed around, and as they are, would you take a piece of the bread? Would you take a cup? Hold on to them until once we've all been served, and then we'll receive those together. If you have an allergy to gluten, we have gluten-free bread in the back. We'd love for you to have that so you don't miss out on what we're doing.
No power, no So Jesus is with his disciples in this upper room and at this table are very common elements they had eaten hundreds of times before. But he takes the bread and he says, this bread is something different now. Moving forward, this bread is going to mark, it's gonna be a symbol of my body broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. Let's do that. After he broke the bread, this young rabbi picked up the cup and said something that changed the course of history. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood given for the forgiveness of sins. Drink in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for an incredible invitation <clears throat> to your mercy seat where we might find grace and mercy in time of need. Thank you for these common elements that remind us of that wonderful invitation that you extended to us and that we embrace even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're wondering what to do with those cups, we have some bowls that are going to be going around as we continue to sing, sing aloud, and let's continue in worship today.
Life can hit hard sometimes. One day everything seems to be going great, and the next we get sidelined by the unexpected. What do you do when the bottom falls out? Where do you turn when the storms hit? When the bank calls, when the job falls through, when that rejection letter comes in, when the doctor gives you the bad news? What or who do you cling to? Isaiah 41.10 speaks directly to the question. Fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God, our Father, is for you, even when it doesn't feel like it. Press on in faith. Cling to hope. Reach out to take hold of the hand of love himself. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on. All right. Good morning. It's great to be with you today. Uh, already, what a great service. Can we thank the worship team? What a great job today. I was thinking of that, those lines in the bridge or the chorus that we were singing, weak made strong by the Savior's love. And what's the last line? I just thought it was really profound. Help me. Uh, through it all, through the storms, he is Lord. Memorable, incredibly memorable lines. <laughs> it's great. I was really good at that first service. There it is. Hey, you guys always got my backside. Way to go. Thank you. But I love that. And that's really been the stuff of this series. Through the storm, he is Lord. Notice that the song lyrics don't say through the storm, it always turns out great and easy. No, but it's saying he's Lord. And, and that's one thing that we have seen in the life of Joseph. We have seen that in the challenges he's faced when the bottom has fallen out, God has been there, and we will see that so clearly today. God has been there all along, and Joseph keeps making these great decisions to reach out, to cling to him when there's really, he has nowhere else to hold on to. And that's really been the stuff, the example for us. 
So we're excited that you're here today. We're at the, the final week of a five-week series called Hold On, looking at the life of Joseph from the book of Genesis. Uh, if you look in your Trinity this week, you'll have some notes that look like this if you want to get those out, help you track with us a little bit. And if you have a Bible today, book Bible, electronic Bible, if you want to make your way to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis 41 is where we'll be. It's the first book of the Bible. Find your way to chapter 41, and we'll dive in in just a minute. I want to give you a couple of thoughts uh, just kind of as we are kind of gathering ourselves today. The first one is we have a new series that we kick off next weekend uh, on marriage, on the essence of biblical marriage called One Plus One Equals One. And we're going to look at the oneness that God has intended marriage to be. If, if you are interested in that subject, obviously be back here next week. If you know people in your relational world that are struggling or those that would just benefit from hearing from God's perspective on what marriage is intended to be, we have cards like these at all the exits today. You could grab one of those. It's a real easy inviter card just to hand to someone, and that could be a great thing. So please join us as we start that series next weekend. We'll have some uh, kind of ancillary pieces to that we'll tell you about next weekend as well that we're looking forward to. Our whole hope is to encourage and help and enhance our marriages, so we're excited to begin that. Also, I want you to know, I don't know if you noticed, wave, uh, wave one, stage one, maybe a better way to say it, stage one of our new signs are up on campus today, and if you notice those, between sandwich boards and different directional signs, we had kind of shared that back in the fall, and those things are finally rolling out, and you'll begin to see more and more on our campus. Our whole goal is we just want people, when they come on campus, to be informed. We want them to be able to find their way around. We want them to feel welcomed as though we were anticipating them coming, and so hopefully uh, that will be more and more of our culture and that this is just one small way that that happens. So I was excited to see those go up this week, and they'll be really helpful as we keep moving forward. Well, as we dive in today, I, I also, last thing I want to say, if you look in your Trinity this week, you'll notice the impact offering uh, result is there. You guys gave almost $17,000 to that. So can we thank God for that? That's so great. And so we are grateful, high school students going to camp that's going to help them get there and all the different costs that are connected to that. Just really grateful for your generosity. So thank you for giving that way. Well, we have been, uh, if you're a guest with us today, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. And even though you have maybe missed out on the first four weeks of the series, it won't be a loss because we'll catch you up a little bit, but also we'll see a lot today from Joseph's response, especially of that of forgiveness. What we've been doing through the series, I've kind of asked you on a weekly basis to do two things. The first one is to watch to watch the responses, to watch the decisions that Joseph makes, uh, a favored son who thought he'd be on top of the world, but he ends up down in the bottom of a dungeon, and to watch the way that he keeps responding when the bottom falls out in his life. The other thing I've asked you to do is to walk, to get into his sandals, and to try to track with what must it have been like to face a new obstacle, a new challenge, a new sense of loss, and how does he keep looking to God to be his strength to keep putting one foot in front of the next? That's the stuff of what we've been doing as we've tried to get into his shoes and see a little bit what life was like. And today, we're going to bring this part to a close and really see, like we said earlier today, this powerful theme of forgiveness. Here's our now what idea. What are we to do with this throughout the week this week? Trust. Trust that the intended evils that others have introduced into your life are things God can use for good and move forward and move forward. This will make sense as we dive in. Let's look at it in your notes. Number one, though we might want to forget our painful experiences, God is wanting to redeem them. Though we are wanting to, at times, forget our painful experiences, God is wanting to redeem them. We're going to finish our time today, and what we're going to see is this reunion of Joseph, this son who had been sold over to human traffickers that the brothers had no idea where he's even going to end up, ends up in Egypt and now after about a period of about 20 years, he's going to be reunited to these same brothers who sold him. Brothers who thought they would never see this guy again are now going to deal with him face to face. And as we dive in and as we look at that, what's powerful to me is that the, the amount of text, if you've been with us in this series, we've kind of taken a portion of scripture and worked our way through it every week. Today we have five chapters to cover. And so the only other way to do that than what I'm doing today is literally could just open the text and read it straight through. That wouldn't be a bad thing. But today I'm going to give you some highlights as we go throughout this, this sequence. But I want you to just even kind of draw attention to that. Five chapters of the Joseph narrative, five chapters are given over to this family being restored. 
of these relationships being reconciled one to another. Let's pull back and see it this way. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It has 50 chapters. That's a long book for biblical standards. 50 chapters, watch this, one-tenth, one-tenth of the entire book of Genesis is dedicated to these relationships being reconciled. That should say something to us. That's a lot of traction, that's a lot of recorded biblical truth for us to grab. And so therefore, I would just kind of surmise from that, it's there for our purposes, it's there for our help to understand how do we deal when tragedy enters our life, especially at the hands of other people. One-tenth of the book of Genesis is devoted to this issue, to this sequence of relationships. And we're gonna see today two key concepts that really surface. The first one is perspective, And the second one is purpose. Perspective in terms of how Joseph, now that he's seen more to the story, remember he was a 17-year-old favored son who ends up the property of someone else. He's just trying to, all, all within a day, that happened that fast, trying to process what on earth is happening to me, and now my life is absolutely skewed from what I thought it would be. He comes to understand that it was through, watch that word, it was through his brother's treacherous, incredibly heartless decisions that God ultimately saved them, saved his brothers, saved himself and the rest of the known world. The trial-filled mysteries he couldn't see while he was living in chapter 37 would now reveal their purpose now that he's living in chapter 41. I have a feeling that for many of us here today, that's the season that you're in. You're in chapter 37. There are incredible challenges. Some are just heartbreaking that you are walking through that absolutely in your mind make no sense. And what we're learning from Joseph, I want you to see this. When Joseph was property of Potiphar, when Joseph was a prisoner in a jail cell, he didn't have the whole story. He didn't know he was going to be elevated to number two in the land. So what was his attitude? What was his disposition while he was in jail, while he was a slave? He had no idea of the future, but what he kept doing was clinging to God. Clinging to God even when none of it made sense. And as it relates to Joseph's God-ordained purpose, remember he had these visions when he was a 17-year-old young man about how God was going to elevate him, how his family was all going to bow down before him. Even though that was vague and even had a pompous attitude about them, now he could see with clarity why God had him on the planet to literally save the world. What a great lesson we've seen demonstrated in his life. Every time he finds himself in these experiences, we kind of brought to the surface last week. Here he is elevated to number two in the land of the world power at that time. But the training, the places where he got training to be able to not just be in that position, but actually be good at that job was while he was in a jail giving leadership to other prisoners. It was while he was a slave in Potiphar's household, giving leadership to the household servants. Would Joseph have ever thought, A, that this was going to be his future, but B, that was going to be God's training ground? I don't think any of us could have seen that coming. But Joseph, along the way, continued to show a sense of trust. God, I cannot see what I'm in right now. This makes no sense. Remember the words that he gave to the cupbearer when the cupbearer was going to be liberated. I have, there's no reason that I should be in this jail. I was sold by my own flesh and blood as a slave. I don't get all this, but I'm trusting that God is going to make sense of it. He didn't stop pursuing his God-communicated purpose even when he was in deplorable circumstances. This is for your notes. Joseph showed that it's never for nothing. Joseph showed it's never for nothing the situations that God walks us through. And I gotta say, that line has stuck in my head pretty much all throughout my ministry career these last 25 years of trying to process God in the middle of what I'm in. If I would just say, I want nothing to do with these circumstances. I don't want to have to deal with these issues and these people. I'm reminded that what I'm in right now, the things I can't control, it's never for nothing. God is going to use it. God is somehow shaping me, preparing me for something in the future. But I want to ask you this question today. What was the thing? 
What was the thing that could have possibly derailed Joseph from being able to live out this God-ordained purpose of being able to have the perspective that he would have? And I would put to you this, the one thing that would have really tripped this whole thing up and really sent him spiraling, that of pouring out wrath and revenge on the brothers who did this to him. Remember last week, I thought this was fascinating. We realized that Joseph, as he is elevated to this number two position, Pharaoh gives him a wife, and in giving him a wife, they have two sons. And if you remember the name of the firstborn son, he named him Manasseh. And Manasseh sounds like the Hebrew word for forget. And he went and he gave an explanation. I've named him Manasseh so that I might forget my homeland and my father's household. I want to forget this family that I have had so many problems with, that have dealt with me so treacherously, I want to put it in the past. Well, the reality is that would be short-lived because those same brothers we're going to see today are going to wind up on his front porch. And now he's going to have to deal. So let's pick up the story. You're in Genesis chapter 41. Joseph is now 30 years old, number two in the land of the most powerful country on the planet. He's married and he has two sons. Pharaoh's dream about seven years of plenty, seven years of famine has come true. And now, <coughs> excuse me, now they're living in that season of famine. We pick it up in chapter 41, verse 56. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. Look at this line. And all of the countries, and all of the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the world. So that's how chapter 41 finishes. Chapter 42 then begins with the famine is also severe in Joseph's land of origin, in the land of Canaan. So Jacob, the, the family patriarch, he sends 10 of his sons down to Egypt to buy grain because he's heard, like others, that they're the only ones on the planet who seem to have food. Now, interestingly enough, since Joseph has been out of the picture for now a couple decades, Jacob had another son, another son by his favorite wife. Now, let me say, when you say the words favorite wife, that's a little weird for you to hear, meaning I hope you have one and I hope she's your favorite. <laughs> but for Jacob, that wasn't the case. He had four women that were wives-esque to him. And, and the, the stories we saw in week one of all the crazy favoritism, they never stopped, even after Joseph. This favored wife, Rachel, has another son. She dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin, Benjamin. And as a result, he becomes the new favored one. So Jacob won't send Benjamin down with the 10 brothers to get the grain for fear that something would happen to him. Interesting. That sounds a lot like a few decades ago of not sending Joseph out to the fields for fear that something would happen to him. He's just repeating history all over again. Now, they have made now, as they come down, they come and they, they, they take a knee before the emperor that they come to beg grain from. They want to buy grain. And as they're on their knee, chapter 42, verse 8 says this, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. Now, when you read those words, what you're hearing is, if, especially if you've never heard the story before, you're hearing Joseph say, I gotcha. I know who you are. You have no idea. You sold me to people to take me God knows where. This is where I ended up. This is what God did. I'm in charge. You're begging for food. Now you're going to get yours. It's exactly what those words sound like at the beginning. You're spies. You've come to check us out. Remember, by the way, it says that Jacob or uh, Joseph remembered his dreams. And remember the position. It must have been a bit surreal that his brothers are all on bended knee in front of him as he's saying these words. What I want you to see in this sequence, as these brothers come down, and as they approach this unknown to them Egyptian official to buy grain, I want you to see that in the sequence, how Joseph responds to them. Well, we said this kind of throughout the series. My intent has never been to somehow disparage the fact of our children hearing the stories and somehow that's wasted. Absolutely not. I've taught all my children as we have raised them up to know these narratives of Joseph. 
and to love them and to learn from them. But here's my point. There's something about my eight-year-old brain that couldn't understand abstract thought that when I heard this narrative on a blue flannel board and saw little characters be moved around, when I heard that, it sounded like at the end of the day, there was a little bit of disruption, but Joseph forgives his brothers and everything ends up happy. When you go back and you read the five chapters that we're looking at today, that would be great for you to do this week. Five, one-tenth of the book devoted to this sequence, you'll see the reason why it takes five chapters is because Joseph is a wreck. Internally, he's in turmoil. Remember, he named his son Manasseh because he thought he'd never have to see them again. God, help me forget that era of my life. I'm moving forward. God brings them back, and now he has to deal. And we're going to see the way he reacts to them, sometimes very understanding and kind, other times extremely harsh. He brings them to this sequence in this first arena. He's accused them as spies. He throws them all into jail. Glad to see you, brothers. Out of that sequence, he finally brings them out and says, maybe you're not spies. I'm going to let you go back, but I'm going to send you back to bring back the brother. He hears there's a brother involved. I want to meet this brother of yours to make sure you're not spies. Oh, and by the way, as a deposit that you'll come back, I'm going to keep one of you here while you're gone. And as you're hearing that with fresh eyes or fresh ears today, you're hearing that and trying to think through, that does sound a little fishy. That does sound a little bit like he's conflicted, like he's kind of for them, but kind of not, and not on the one hand ripping their heads off, but on the other hand, he's surely not. This is some good, happy family reunion. Interestingly enough, by the way, the brothers in this sequence are beside themselves. They, they just thought they were coming down to buy grain. This was not going to be, I mean, it was, it was a long trip, but it was not going to be fraught with being put in jail. And this is what they say. Your Bibles are in Genesis 42. Look at verse 21. They're saying this to one another. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. Look at this. Look at this revelation. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. They have this karma-esque idea that because they did bad to their brother, now this is happening to them. Reuben replied, Did I, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen? Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Now watch this. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them. They're saying this in front of a guy that while they're speaking their Hebrew dialect, they, they know this guy doesn't know that. He's Egyptian. He's hearing the entire conversation. They didn't realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. I want you to see today a little bit of some of the story you might have missed. And you didn't miss it because it wasn't in the Bible. And you didn't miss it because you didn't have great teachers who taught you the word of God. You missed it because you have a concrete brain at eight years old that can't understand abstract thoughts well. And when these truths are being put on a board, you're hearing it kind of going, well, that seems odd, and you just keep moving. Now, you're in his sandals, and you're saying, he is a mess. He is one moment seemingly for them, another moment throwing them into jail, one moment accusing them to be spies, another moment weeping over the sense of they understand what is going on. They understand that from this God-sized perspective, that God was doing something as a result of their treachery. Joseph is conflicted. And I want you to see that today because rather than us saying, hey, there are people in your life who've ushered pain. It has come at their hands. Just get over it and forgive them. I don't want you to hear that today because I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I don't think that's what this narrative demonstrates. What it demonstrates is pain. What it demonstrates is challenge and turmoil as Joseph is trying to figure out how in the world am I going to move forward? I wanted to put this behind me. God has brought it back front and center and I have to deal with these brothers. He goes back and forth, accusing them, then detaining them, then grieving and then blessing all at once. He's an absolute mess. When he looks back, he would say the actions that they took against him were the cause of the bottom falling out in his life. 
And yet the actions that they did against him are the reason he's number two in the world power. Do you see how both of those are true? The things you did to me caused my life to be forever changed. But that change has resulted in the fact that God has exalted me to a position of power and influence I couldn't have dreamed. They're both true. They're both in, happening in real time. And Joseph's trying to figure out how in the world do I move forward with these guys that I know, I know, as much as I've wanted to put them out of my mind, I've thought about this moment. What would I do if I ever saw them again? I want to say that for the struggles that you have, some of you are here today and it is the issue. Right? We're all going through things, we're all wrestling with challenges in our lives, but the issue that you walked in with today is you're at a crossroads trying to figure out how to forgive. And you've let the pain of the past, you've let not just painful circumstances, but things done by people to you cause you to now be at this place where you say, God, I don't know how to move forward because I am stuck. Those things have never healed over into scars. They're just as open and just painful and raw as they were the day they happened. And I gotta think that if there has been a sequence in this Joseph narrative that you have struggled to identify with, you're not struggling today. Because that's exactly what must have been going on through his head. God, how am I gonna move forward? I want you to see this. I want you to see that today we're gonna realize that Joseph is to be commended for the way that he ultimately forgives his brothers. Though there's some back and forth and even what I would call games, and I don't mean games like he's just playing with them, I think games like he's trying to figure out how do I do this? And even though he's gonna be commended, we're gonna say Joseph's a great example of ultimately how to forgive people who've hurt you, the best example. The ultimate example in how to forgive was another one who was betrayed by those who were as close as, the, as a brother, by a disciple. And even in the moments when he was dying on a cross, he prayed, he cried out to God, God, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. You see, watch this. Jesus is not only the perfect example of how to forgive, Jesus was the mode Jesus was the means by which we can even know what forgiveness is, even have the ability to be forgiven. That's why we took some time today in our communion experience to talk about that's one of the incredible truths that happen at this table that we reflect on and we're grateful for is God sends his one and only son into the world to die on our behalf. And in the moment, he doesn't do so begrudgingly. He doesn't do so with a hard heart. He goes to a cross, even for those who have betrayed him, those who have plotted to kill him, and he prays to the Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. We've said all along, there is so much to learn about how to respond from the life of Joseph, but all the way through, Jesus is the hero of the story of Joseph. Joseph's always typifying things that Jesus would do in perfection, and Jesus is that. Jesus became our mode of salvation, our mode of forgiveness. And I want to put out to you today, we said it earlier in the communion um, moment that forgiveness is unfair, meaning people have done something against you and it would be fair as it were. It'd be one plus one equals two. It would be fair for you to do something back. But forgiveness says to forgive you is to put a zero at the bottom of the ledger sheet to erase the debt and I would put to you today, the reason you can forgive is because of the fact that you've been forgiven. Because I don't know how to forgive apart from that. There's a lot of practical things. I hear it all the time. You, you only hurt yourself when you don't forgive. It's for your psychology, for your physiology. It's true. Those things are all bad. But at the end of the day, to really come before a person and come before God clean and say, I forgive you happens when we recognize for how much we've been forgiven. We're going to see that in stereo today. Number two, trusting in God's sovereign control allows you to move forward even when you don't have all the answers. Trusting in God's sovereign control allows you to move forward even when you don't have all the answers. 
Now, the brothers, at this point, the brothers have been sent back. They, remember, Joseph kept one as a token, right? your deposit, sends the nine back. They come back, and, and as they get there, they open up their bags with all this grain, and the money they brought to buy the grain is in the bag. That looks a lot like theft. So now they're equally concerned about this whole another thing. Not only does, did Joseph keep one of them, one of the brothers, but now it looks like they stole the grain on the way out of town. And now they're just freaking out and they come and tell their dad, dad, we can't go back. We, we, we've been told to go bring this grain, but we're supposed to come back with that favorite kid of yours, Benjamin, because he wants to meet him. And the dad must have been thinking, why do you want to meet my kid? No. No is the answer. So watch this. And sometimes we read over this narrative and we'll miss this. They ate all the grain they brought back. Nobody, you would have thought, hey, we get back to Canaan, we tell our dad this horrible news. You'd have thought someone gets on a donkey quick and runs back to Egypt. No, they stay for months eating the food they have because I think the dad, Jacob, must be thinking the rain's going to come back, the crops are going to grow. Eh, I'm going to miss that guy in Egypt, but at least I still got Benjamin. <laughs> they do. They just eat everything they have. They're in no hurry. We're just going to eat all the grain these guys brought back and hopefully never have to go back to Egypt. But they eat it all, the rain never comes, no crops grow, they're now equally as hungry, as much as in famine as they were before. And Jacob finally comes to this place where he realizes there's no way out of this. I've got, if we're gonna survive, I've gotta send Benjamin down. So Benjamin comes back with the brothers. And as they come back and there is this reunion, there's another sequence of these kind of back and forth kind of games that Joseph is playing with them. But ultimately, in chapter 45, Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. Think about that just for a moment. Get, get in the sandals of one of those nine brothers, 10. Probably let the guy out of jail for this part. Imagine being one of those 10 brothers, and this guy you've been dealing with that's really confusing. You're trying to figure him out. He just does weird stuff. He's emotional. You just can't figure him out. All of a sudden, he starts speaking in Hebrew. And the scales fall off your eyes and you realize that's Joe. I'm thinking right now when you're thinking of what's been happening and how this relationship has been and also the fact that he's the number two guy in this land, you're thinking your days are numbered. You have no, no call right now. You are absolutely at his mercy. And it's in that moment Chapter 45 of Genesis that we read amazing words, how Joseph confronts them. Chapter five, verse, or 45, verse five, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Watch this. Because it was to save lives that God, God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five, there will be no plowing or reaping. Here it is again. God sent me ahead of you. It's hard for me to read those words and not get emotional. You put me in the pit. That's what I would want to say in this moment. This happened because you betrayed me. Every movie you've ever seen, every situation you've imagined with people who have hurt you, that's the moment you're waiting for. Joseph, God sent me ahead of you. That's why he's such an amazing example to us. He has this perspective that God was everywhere this was happening. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8, so then it was not you who sent me, but God. That's how Joseph sees it. He sees that God was in it. God was in the pit. God was in Potiphar's household. God was in the prison. God was in the prison while he languished for two more years, forgotten. God was in the palace. God was the one who ordered Joseph's steps. 
That kind of God perspective, that kind of idea of seeing that God is absolutely in control of my life, not just what I do, but even what happens to me. That's the kind of perspective we all need. Because Joseph wasn't unique in the fact of he's the only guy on the planet who's ever seen it this way. He's unique in that he understood it and then acted it out. That's our challenge. We can know a lot of good theology, but when the bottom falls out, are we understanding God loves me no less than when everything was awesome? Perspective changes things. It provides a clarity that even though you can see, it doesn't mean that the things that happened to you didn't hurt. It doesn't mean that the people who did them weren't wrong in doing them, but it gives you the ability to say, God has always been in this. It changes your understanding of the why and the who of your troubles. I want you to hear clearly today, this doesn't make everything go away. I want you to hear that. Please don't over, hear me overstating something that as long as you can connect dots in your pain, then all of a sudden all the pain goes away and everything's easy. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is when we can say, when God gives us, he pulls back the veil and shows us this was what I was doing, that perspective can give us the ability to keep putting one foot in front of the next and remind us God is in this. God is leading this. God is absolutely in control. Now, you might be saying, Todd, that's really great. <laughs> With that kind of sarcasm, too. It's really great for the people in the room who can connect the dots to their pain. I'm not one of those. I've had painful things happen to me that seemingly are all a blur. They make no sense. There's no dot to connect. And therefore, I have no perspective of how this ever is going to be better or how this is ever going to make sense for anything good. I want you to know I hear you. And there are things that have happened in my life at 47 years old that I look back, painful things, and go, God, you have not connected that dot yet. And the thing for you and the thing for me is to realize that in order for Joseph to keep going, to not just fall apart altogether, he had to learn, he had to trust that God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. There's the ability to say, God, even though I can't see it, even though to my eye right now this makes no sense, I'm going to keep believing you that you are going to make sense of this. Even if it's not until heaven that I get a clear picture. Because guess what? When Joseph was a slave, I'm sure he didn't have perspective to know what was coming. When Joseph was a prisoner, remember in the prisoner, the sequence of the cup there, he even says, there's no reason why I'm here. I was sold as a slave by my brothers. I've done nothing to deserve being in this jail, wrongfully accused by that guy's wife. He, he understands, God, there's no reason that this has happened to me that is fair. But he kept putting one foot in front of the next because he believed. He believed that God was in control of his situations when they were awesome and when in his perspective they weren't. One of the last things that happens in this whole book of Genesis is Joseph reaffirming these words, look at it. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, talking to his brothers, but God intended it for good. God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This is the decision you have to make today. It's in your notes. Do you trust that God is working for your good, even though you can't make sense of the muck? Even though you can't make sense of the muck you're having to walk through today? A decision you make, you make this on a daily basis to say, God, I can't see it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And yes, though there are times in my life I've been able to look back with perspective and say, God, I could see now what you were doing. There are other times where in the moment I can't see anything. But God, I believe you. God, I entrust myself to you that you know things I can't begin to know. And when you say that, you are simply attesting and giving credence to the truth all over scripture. That's why we assign words to God like sovereign. We assign words to God like all-knowing, all-wise, because he absolutely knows. 
So, it's my daughter's 16th birthday next week, Kendall, and, and she had a party this weekend, had all some besties with her, uh, and our house was uh, crazy, and it was awesome. And within that, on Friday night, we went over, our area has like a community pool, and so uh, nine girls traipsed through the community, um, waking everyone up, and it was great. And as we got to the pool, I was sitting in there already, I brought an Ellie and a friend over, and we were sitting there, and uh, all the girls get in the hot tub for a little bit. And what was really kind of cool about this moment for me as a dad, it just kind of, I think, just happened. It wasn't intended to happen, but Kendi went around, and she named the times when she met each of her friends. Like, this is when we first connected. And what was really interesting is I'm a dad, I'm very quiet, I just listen, but if she's going around connecting dots, she said on multiple occasions, it must have been at least three, um, oh, you and I became friends because our parents kind of forced it. <laughs> and it became such a theme that she said herself, like, that's really weird, that's happened a few times now. And I remember thinking about that and listening and kind of going, and obviously being forced into a friendship and being a slave in Egypt are two different things. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. But I was thinking about perspective and I was thinking about in the moment when she, not, not now, now that she's turning 16 and has all these friends and these, these are great young women who love Jesus and I'm just so encouraged by the people that are surrounding her life. But I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking in the moment back in third grade, that was not super fun. When mom and dad said on both sides, hey, why don't you guys go play? Why don't you guys spend time together? Why don't you guys, you know, hang out after school? And they're just looking at each other like, mm, you look weird, you know? <laughs> and now looking back with perspective years later, able to go, you're some of my best friends. See, what we don't know is what we don't know. And the great news is that we have a God who does. I started this series by telling you about a Max Lucado book that I'd still wholeheartedly recommend. It's called You'll Get Through This. It's all about the life of Joseph. But I want to give to you, I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's quite long, but I'm going to give you another illustration he gave. It's called Woodcutter's Wisdom. And it's about this guy. This guy's a poor man in a village, and um, he has a horse. He's very poor. He goes into the wood to cut down limbs and trees and comes out, sells it as firewood. So it's a very meager existence. But it's this beautiful horse that people have offered great money for. And he's told them no every time. And he's told them no because the horse is like a, a, a son to him. It's like family. I can't, I can't sell a person. So one day he wakes up in the morning and this horse is gone, left the stable. And all the people from the village, they come to him and they say, hey, old man, you are such a fool. People offered you great money for that horse, but you kept turning them down, and now you you're, totally have no luck. Everything's gone bad for you. And they're just kind of assailing him in his foolishness, and he says, hey, don't say that. Just say that the horse is out of the stable. That's all we know. And they look at him, and they go, we don't need great philosophy. What we know is that you're a fool, and they walk away. It's about 15 days later, and the horse reappears. And this time he reappears with a dozen wild horses that he had wrangled up that were in the forest and he brings them all home. And the village people come out and they say, oh, you were right. What's an amazing thing. We thought it was such a bad thing when your horse left, but he brought back a dozen wild horses. This is so great. He says, you go too far. Just say the horse is back and he brought some friends. That's all we know for now. And they go, oh, you don't understand you. You have this fortune now standing in front of you. You've got to, all you need to do is break these horses. They'll be so great for other people to buy. And he's like, too much. You say too much, just say this. It'd be a few weeks later as they're beginning to break the other wild horses that his son falls off one of the horses and breaks both legs. And the village comes out again and said, oh, you are so right. You knew it. You knew that this was, it was probably going to end up bad. He says, you guys are impossible. <laughs> we don't know anything except for that my son fell and broke both of his legs. Don't judge beyond what you can't see. We only see life in fragments. Don't judge the whole book by one page. Don't judge the whole phrase by one word. You only get a little at a time. They left again thinking he was a fool. It'd be just a couple weeks later that that nation went to war and 
The army came and they recruited from their village. They took every single son from that village to fight except the woodcutter's son because he'd broken both legs. And the, the families came weeping to him. And they said, oh, you are so right. <laughs> so right that your son breaking his legs ended up being a good thing because he didn't have to go to war. And he said, I just can't put up with you. <laughs> Only say that your sons went to war, mine did not. That's all we know. And I remember reading that illustration years ago and thinking, isn't that the way we roll? We're so quick to judge. You would look back on certain situations in your life and you would say, this was a horrible thing. With a little bit of time and a little bit of perspective, you'd look back on many of them and say, but I see what God was doing. Or, praise God, that thing happened to me because then this didn't. Let us be careful for how quick we attach words like good and bad to situations and just keep saying, God, I can trust that you're in control. That's what I know. That's all I know, but that's what I know. Finally today, number three, rather than hope for a comfortable life, pray for the perseverance to live out God's purpose. Rather than hope for a comfortable life, pray for perseverance to live out God's purpose. Ultimately, Joseph would be reunited with his father. It wasn't just the brothers that came down. They would send back word for Jacob and ultimately a group of 70. 70 come down and they settle in Egypt and be, uh, they're reunited with this favored son, this Joseph. They would be there in Egypt for about 400 years, and that group of 70 would multiply to about 2 million. The family would grow, and they would grow into a nation. And there, this reunion of Jacob and Joseph, chapter 46 of Genesis, verse 29, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father, and he wept for a long time. Israel Jacob is the same name, same person. Israel said to Joseph, now I am ready to die since I've seen for myself that you are still alive. Never thought. Remember, his, his last understanding of Joseph was a shredded coat that his brothers would deceive the dad by and saying he was eaten by a wild animal. Now he gets to see this son 20 plus years later, throw his arms around him and be reunited. Now this idea, by the way, just so you have perspective and so we know what God had written, interestingly enough, they should have somehow expected. Watch this. Earlier in the book, Genesis 15, God comes to Abram and in a vision, look what he tells him. As the sun was setting, Abram, this would be the great grandfather of, J of Joseph, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they'll be enslaved and mistreated treated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. That would be called the exile in the book of Exodus. And God was laying this out even before people like Jacob and Joseph were on the planet. God knows. God is seeing it all in real time. And so our, our walk away, our takeaway from this study in the book of Joseph, let's model and emulate some of the things he did. Let's be people that wherever we are, we are there. We're present, and no matter how bad the circumstances, thinking, God, you called me to be faithful to you, my audience of one, even though I would have never chosen these circumstances, this is where I'm at. Now help me to honor you. Joseph did that. Joseph lived in such a way that God was gonna use him to be a source of blessing even to those who had betrayed him. Can we see ourselves through a lens of saying, God, I wanna let you be the one who's guiding my life and even you be the one who brings forgiveness to my pain, knowing that somehow you can use even the painful things in my life for good. And that's our now what idea as we walk out this week. Trust that the intended evils that others have introduced into your life are things God can use for good and move forward. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today as a group of people who would say that it is hard when the bottom falls out, it is hard to keep putting one foot in front of the next. Whether it's issues of just shock of what's happened to us, whether it's a sense of betrayal of those who maybe it's been at their hands, maybe it's even you, God. Maybe we come and we question you. If you are so powerful, how did this happen? 
God, teach us in the narrative of Joseph. Teach us by what you've given us descriptively to follow an example of a man who said, God, I can't make sense of what's going on in these circumstances, but I want to be present. I want to be faithful to you. And I believe, God, that you have my life in your hands. I believe that your ways are higher than mine. And for the things I don't understand, I'm going to have to trust you. Father, would we be a people marked by that kind of trust? Would we be a people that when the bottom falls out, we cling tightly to you and we allow you to walk us through? Help us be those people this week. We love you and we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. So sorry. <laughs> um, before we close, we're going to uh, invite the ushers to come forward and uh, we'll receive the offering during this last song. And I uh, wanted to let you know if you're a guest, please don't feel any obligation to give and just be our guest this morning. And when the basket goes by, uh, may you join us and stand as we sing a song that, that proclaims the, that God is above our circumstances and above our storms and our troubles and that we could trust and we could still claim victory even in the, in the midst of what we could be going through. So let's sing this together.
Lord, we thank you that you are so high above everything we go through, Lord. Everything that's good and bad in our lives, Lord, that you, that you use it for your purpose, God. And that we could trust in that, Lord. We could trust in your promises, Lord. We can trust that you never leave us or forsake us, Lord, but that you walk through the valleys with us, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, I wanted to remind you before you leave that if you'd like prayer, we'll have some people up front who would love to pray with you. Uh, besides that, have a great Sunday.